Does nature make laws an introduction to the natural law tradition? I've been invited to deliver an introductory lecture on the natural law tradition. Having accepted that invitation, I feel bound to honor it. In one way, my acceptance was an act of self-binding, like making a promise or a vow, I took on an obligation. But there seems to be a source of obligation outside of myself. I promised something, so I owe it, and not just to myself, but to others. But why must the promise be kept? Why can I find myself, even by my own action, in a state of obligation to others, to you, my audience? To talk about the natural law tradition is not only to offer a particular perspective on how to answer this question, but also to elucidate what the question itself reveals about the human condition. Before I proceed, allow me to make some distinctions. As a topic for a lecture, nat natural law admits of different modes of approach and scopes of focus. We can speak of the general obligation of natural law as a whole, or of specific obligations of the natural law, such as keeping one's promises. We can also speak of those obligations, general or specific, precisely conceived as obligations of natural law, and we can consider how conceiving of obligation as natural law relates obligation to other parts of moral philosophy and theology. And of course, we can also speak of how different historical thinkers have developed theories of natural law with respect to any of the previous four topics already distinguished, and of how the idea of natural law and particular theories of natural law have been defended against various forms of criticism. Indeed, one can find extensive scholarship in each of these areas. There is scholarship about how and in what way natural law in general is binding, and about particular topics such as slavery or sexual ethics or just war or suicide or capital punishment conceived as falling under natural law. One can find scholarship about the sense in which natural law is law and the sense in which that law is natural and also about the relationship between natural law and virtue, the passions, practical reasoning, conscience, rights, man-made positive law and other topics and one can find scholarship about the origins of natural law theory, usually mentioning Plato, Aristotle, and Stoics, especially Cicero, about the role of natural law theory in the Catholic intellectual tradition, and preeminently in Aquinas, and on the evolution of natural law theory in later medieval and early modern thinkers, as well as different versions of natural law theories in contemporary philosophy, often developed in response to criticism of rival theories. I can't cover, and you wouldn't want me to cover, all of that in an introductory lecture on the natural law tradition. I hope to discuss just enough that if you are so inclined, you could pursue further inquiry into the natural law tradition along any of these paths that may interest you and be able to appreciate how they are related. In what follows, I will generally set aside discussion of particular instances or cases of natural law reasoning and I will also generally set aside developments of natural law theories in late medieval, modern, and contemporary thought. My focus will be on understanding natural law as taught by Aquinas with attention to how he characterizes natural law as law and how natural law conceived as law is related to other topics crucial to the theory and practice of the moral life. Some people today might introduce and perhaps I've made it sound as if I'm about to introduce Aquinas' understanding of natural law as if it were a very specific and perhaps highly technical theory, one of many rival approaches to moral and political reasoning, a theory perhaps now associated with a political agenda or ideological inclination, and a view which one is free to accept or reject. Yet it seems to me that a proper introduction to the Thomistic idea of natural law should make clear how intuitive commonsensical, and indeed unavoidable, the idea of natural law is. Heinrich Roman, surveying the history of the idea of natural law, described its eternal recurrence. That's in the subtitle of the original German book. We could go farther and talk about the inescapability of natural law. It is not only that people are governed by the natural law, whether they know it or not, which is the case, 
but that at least on some level, everybody does know that they are governed by the natural law. Aquinas says that some knowledge of natural law cannot be avoided. But if I seek to defend the inescapability of natural law, along the way, I hope I can also explain why, despite being inescapable, discussion of natural law is widely held to be contentious. Why, that is, it seems to be so difficult both to gain assent to the general idea that there is a natural law and to establish consensus about specific requirements of natural law. So first main section is what is natural law? Let us start with the basic idea of law. In common experience, law, whether we mean formal legislation of an official government or a family's house rules or a university's code of conduct or the requirements of a professor's syllabus, is some kind of binding force, something that creates not only an expectation, but an obligation of behavior. As my examples suggest, we learn this idea from experience in which the law is made by human beings. But as soon as we notice that man-made law can bind us, we seem to also be aware that we are bound by something even before man-made law. The law from the lawmaker says you ought to do something, but why ought you to obey the law? Why ought you to do what the lawmaker says? The professor has rules in the syllabus, but you also form a judgment about whether those rules are reasonable and fair. How do you do that? Especially if your professor changes the rules halfway through the semester, you will evaluate almost automatically whether the changes accord with some standard of justice that was not laid out, but presumed by the syllabus. You all know what I'm talking about, right? Let's take some less trivial examples. Perhaps you are a black civil rights leader in the 1960s, and in order to protest discriminatory laws in Alabama, you are even willing to go to jail for breaking them, precisely to point out that there is a higher law to which those human laws do not conform. Or let's say you are a grieving woman in ancient Thebes whose brother recently died in a civil war. Burying him is contrary to the law laid down by the king of Thebes, but you sense the injustice of the law and don't feel obligated to obey it, Indeed, you feel obligated by something prior to and higher than the man-made law to disobey the man-made law and honor your brother with a proper burial. Martin Luther King Jr. did in fact explain in his letter from a Birmingham jail that his civil disobedience was motivated by a sense of a higher law, a moral law prior to man-made law and to which man-made law must conform. And Sophocles' Antigone is often taken to give early voice to the idea of a natural law, cited by Aristotle and many thinkers since as a law according to nature. Once we see examples like that, it is hard not to realize that if we ever want to condemn, resist, or reform unjust human laws, or if we even want to evaluate whether laws should be condemned, resisted, or reformed, we must have reference to some standard of justice that is prior to the man-made law. In its most general form, the idea of natural law is just this that there is something that binds or obliges us before and independent of man-made law. If it were not for such a law before human law, we could not perceive that some laws are just and that just laws ought to be obeyed, nor could we judge that some laws are unjust and, at least in some circumstances, ought not to be obeyed. Without some such conception of a law prior to human law, we also could not respect that the allocation of authority to make laws can be just or unjust, nor could we judge between who has the authority to make an authentic law and who does not. We measure not only individual man-made laws, but also the very human authority by which such law is made against some sense of obligation, right, or just rule that precedes any rule made by human beings. I also hope it is clear from my examples and from this description that the notion of natural law is not partisan or ideological. For entirely contingent historical reasons, talk of natural law in American political discourse today is often associated with conservative thought. But in fact, for several decades now, conservative scholars of constitutional jurisprudence have been even more than their progressive counterparts, likely to refer to original meaning or intent, measuring legal reasoning only against the human text, not against some higher natural law, a form of what is called legal positivism. By contrast, it is more progressive or activist judges who have found it easier to appeal to standards of justice outside the written text of the Constitution. They may not do so by invoking natural law by name, 
but only the idea of a higher law or standard of just, justice prior to written law can give sense to such claims. So it should be evident already that a non-human source of obligation or independent standard of justice can be acknowledged without presuming any particular content of such law and can be expressed without using the phrase natural law and can even be expressed in terms that do not explicitly describe the standard as any sort of law at all. <clears throat> we can explain how you judge the fairness of your professors or how Martin Luther King discerned the injustice of Jim Crow laws or how Antigone resisted the tyranny of Creon using other terminology. We could talk about conscience or rights or duties or fairness or justice or really anything that invokes a standard not made by human beings. In one of the most important modern books about natural law, The Abolition of Man, C.S. Lewis reaches outside the Western tradition and invokes the Hindu notion of rata, a great pattern, and the Chinese notion of the Tao, the way. And to emphasize how uncontroversial even the basic content of the natural law is, Lewis collects a long list of examples from across time and nationality of common commands of the way, doing good for others, not committing slander, fraud, or trickery, being loyal to friends and family, honoring elders, caring for children, sacrificing for one's community, repaying debts, keeping promises. For most of human history, these things have been acknowledged without having to be theorized as elements of natural law. Aristotle was describing some of the most commonly recognized contents of natural law when, after defining virtue in terms of a mean, he names three kinds of actions that are always prohibited, that admit of no mean, theft, adultery, and murder. He does so without argument and without any account of the source of the prohibitions. Presumably, in a reasonably healthy culture, we wouldn't even argue about such things. C.S. Lewis was right. It is difficult, in fact, to find any culture or tradition anywhere which entirely steps outside this conception of a standard of justice or obligation prior to human fiat. Even the most innovative attempts to describe a basis for social life and morality other than natural law still end up capturing a sense of obligation prior to human law. I will give two illustrations. Thomas Hobbes famously argues that in the state of nature there is no justice, and that what we call justice emerges only with the formation of the social contract through human convention. And yet, why ought the social contract to be obeyed? And why are members of society still allowed to disobey laws for the sake of self-protection? Hobbes would not answer in terms of natural law, and yet the fact that he does provide an answer in terms of the notion of a compact and of a natural right to self-protection suggests that despite himself, he retains a sense of binding obligation or justice prior to man-made law. Likewise, another quintessential modern John Stuart Mill tried to offer a utilitarian defense of political liberty without any appeal to abstract right. And yet, even he acknowledged that political liberty only suited a certain kind of civilized society, while a more barbarian one might need to be governed by a benevolent despotism. Who gets to judge and why? It seems that Mill must acknowledge, at least implicitly, an independent standard for how human beings should behave apart from any man-made conventions about how, in fact, they do behave. So far, I have argued that the basic idea of natural law as a binding obligation or moral standard is inescapable, in part by acknowledging that it has not always been conceived of as natural law. In fact, historically, it was something of an odd achievement to think of this obligation in terms of law in the first place. The conceptual extension of the law from the realm of man-made codes to a universal principle of action independent of particular human communities involved an originally awkward development of linguistic usage. The Greek word for law, nomos, just meant human convention. It was effectively the opposite of phusis, or nature. The Greek mind thus divided the world into the realm of phusis and nomos, the natural and the conventional. And to speak of natural law, would have first sounded to an ancient Greek ear like something of a paradox. Aristotle, in the Nicomachean Ethics, clearly associates justice with law, and he is willing to distinguish conventional or legal justice from natural justice. 
But despite the logical implication, he does not venture to speak of natural law. Aristotle does speak of the law according to nature in his rhetoric, commenting on Antigone. But we usually credit the Stoics with extending Greek nomos to include the realm of phusis. Long since this Greek and Roman Stoic development, words have continued to develop in meaning, and this in some way accounts for modern confusions and controversies about what is meant by natural law. But even Aquinas, who is arguably the greatest synthesizer of the natural law tradition, himself does not seem to have taken for granted that it was simple or even necessary to speak of moral obligation as natural law. His questions on law, including extensive treatment of natural law in the Summa Theologiae, are so careful and thorough that they are often referred to as an independent treatise. But Aquinas barely mentions natural law in his earlier theological treatises, the Summa Contra Gentiles and his commentary on the sentences, nor does he bring up natural law in his philosophical commentary on Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics. So while I've been arguing that it is inescapable to grasp that there is a higher law, I have also acknowledged that it is not inescapable to call this a law, much less to call it a natural law. To conceive of moral obligation as natural law was a particular achievement in intellectual history. Aquinas is deservedly credited with recognizing and capitalizing on this achievement and exploring its implications. We need to consider next how, for Aquinas, the idea of moral obligation as natural law reveals something about the nature of moral obligation, deliberation, and decision-making, as well as human nature in general. So the next main section of the paper is called Natural Law, Qua Natural Law, How is Natural Law Law, and How is it Natural? Almost a tongue twister. Often objections to the very idea of natural law are rooted in misconceptions about the relevant notions of law and nature. To appreciate what is gained by conceiving of moral obligation as natural law, we need to clarify how Aquinas understood nature and how he understood law. According to a common modern conception, nature is something simply given, lacking purpose or design, a collection of stuff that may happen to settle into regular patterns or into normal, which is to stay, say statistically average behavior, but in itself lacking order and intention. Many people have in fact been taught that modern science advanced precisely because old ideas of design and purpose of formal and final cause were boldly laid aside so that nature could be conceived of only in terms of motion and matter. Of course, we know the oak tree is alive and produces acorns in order to reproduce and that to grow and flourish, the tree ought to have a certain kind of climate and soil. But we are sometimes taught to think of the oak tree atomistically as a collection of particles that just happen to be moving around in a very complicated way. In this way, even though the notion of purpose and design persist in the actual practice of science and the actual discourse of science textbooks, the theorization of science, and thus the theorization of nature, often remains in metaphysical confusion, reductionist, materialistic, and so trying to separate nature from any observation of its tendencies and inclinations and from judgments about what ought to happen or what is good or fulfilling. On this modern view of nature, we can think of nature as governed by laws, the law of gravity and laws of thermodynamics, but these laws are not in any way obligations. For the modern mind, the notion of law seems to have bifurcated. On the one hand, there is law as it might apply outside of human affairs, a general description of regular events at best taken as a kind of metaphor of law in the sense of some governing or binding force, but really more like an equation or summary or description of statistical regularity. Law as assertion about how nature happens to behave, not about what should happen. On the other hand, when we make judgments about what humans ought to do or what would be conducive to our fulfillment, we assume we are engaged in a very different kind of reasoning not only set apart from, but in some ways at odds with nature. Human beings might try to manipulate or control nature, but we do so as somehow impinging our will on nature from the outside. So law as applied within human affairs retains a notion of guiding or limiting action that would otherwise be free. The source of law on this modern view is the will of the lawgiver. Law in this sense is an expression of power and a mode of control 
It might be freely issued from the lawgiver, and those subject to it may have to freely submit to it. But those exercises of freedom are measured only in terms of self-interest, of the distribution and management of power. Thus, in a common modern way of thinking, law as applied to nature is something purely descriptive and not in any way a cause of action, while law as applied to human beings is a genuine cause of action, but as something inherently restrictive and manipulative. Aquinas's conception of natural law offers an opportunity to consider alternatives, I would say correctives, to these modern notions of nature and law. For Aquinas, what is natural is what bears within it its own principles of action. Something is natural to the extent that it bears an intrinsic order or tendency as plants respond to sunlight, fire burns, and the planets move, the motions, activities, and potencies of things can be more or less complex and manifest in different modes, but they are all evidence of things having characteristic tendencies or final causes given to them by their specific form or nature. Many early modern philosophers mocked the idea of final and formal causality in nature, but in doing so, they only revealed their own failure to understand basic vocabulary about obvious intelligibility and activity of natural things. Gravity and growth and generation are powers which act in and through particular kinds of bodies. It is true that as certain positivist philosophers have suggested, and as Hume's arguments about causality already implied, we can be agnostic about actual forces and powers that explain why bodies behave in a certain way, and instead fixate on a law of gravity as a general rule that massive bodies behave in a certain way. But there is something oddly unscientific about this. To deny that nature has its own intrinsic designs and purposes, its forces and powers and causes, is to deny that nature has its own intelligibility. It reduces scientists to describing an intelligibility that is really only in their own minds, only an interpretation of observation. Scientists on this view do not discover the actual intelligibility of natural activity. This has obvious implications for the notion of law. To believe in a descriptive law of gravity without also believing that that law is true on account of a determining force of gravity is to conceive of a law less like a binding power in nature and more as a summary of how we observe otherwise inexplicable regularity in nature. On the other hand, if there is an actual power of gravity, it itself is and expresses a law, a cause of action, a regulating force that binds objects to behave in a certain way. To think of nature as intelligible thus helps us to clarify the sense in which the forms in things determining their ends could be conceived as expressions of law. One can think of law as merely an arbitrary constraint, a code of conduct constricting and directing behavior, and indeed in human experience, perhaps this is how we sometimes experience human law. But for Aquinas, it is in the nature of law that it expresses a coherent rule. Law for Aquinas is not an expression of will and desire, but an expression of mind and rationality. This is, for Aquinas, the proper genus of law, the essential category of its definition. Law is a dictate of reason, a command of practical intelligence, not power, thought. And this is not only true of human law, but of the, even of the law by which God governs creation, making things to be what they are. The divine fiat, do this, expresses the divine logos, intelligence or reason. It is only by understanding the genus of law as a dictate of reason that the other parts of the definition of law make sense as specifying this dictate as a law. It must be expressed by intelligence from a relevant authority who is exercising that intelligence for the care of the community, and it must be shared with, published or promulgated to the members of that community. If the dictate of reason were not promulgated, if it were for a private rather than a common interest, if it were not from a legitimate authority, it would lack something essential to law. It would be defective law. It would not, in fact, be a law. We can now see how Aquinas would answer and reformulate the question, does nature make laws? The answer is no, but nature obeys law and indeed encodes the law promulgated to it. For law is an expression of intelligence and nature, all of physical creation, 
has received a form or design according to which it behaves with specific appropriate action or purpose. Simply as manifesting formal and final causality then, nature can be said to be obedient to law, to an intelligible order. Aquinas understood this intelligible order as properly law. It is a dictative reason of the creator, the divine maker of nature. God is the legitimate authority and he has care of the community, responsibility for his creation. God promulgates or shares this law with his creation in the mode appropriate for his creation by encoding it in the very nature of the things he created. The rock does not need to be conscious of the law of gravity to know it. The rock, simply by being a rock and having the mass it does, knows and is empowered to obey the law of gravity which God has promulgated to all massive bodies. So nature does not make laws, but nature obeys laws made by God. And in a way, we could say that nature encodes and is even an expression of laws made by God. This law, which Aquinas calls the eternal law, is just another name for God's providence over all of creation. The eternal law is the divine reason insofar as it has oversight over creation. And physical things receive and manifest that oversight by having the distinctive physical natures they have. It is thanks to this conception of nature and law as both manifestations of intelligible order that Aquinas can situate ethics as part of the same general project of reasoning about creation. Both are part of reasoning about community under God's governance. Human beings are a part of nature and we are governed by the same eternal law that governs nature. But we are a special and distinctive part and what makes us special and distinctive does not separate us from nature. Rather, it gives us a special role in relation to the rest of nature and a special relationship to the eternal law that governs all of nature. What makes us special and distinctive, according to Aquinas, is that we have a share in the rational conscious determination of our behavior. It is one way in which we bear an image of the divine in us, that we are not only subject to God's providence, but participate in it by exercising providence over our own actions, moral agency. Thus, when Aquinas defines natural law as governing distinctively human nature, he defines it as man's participation in the eternal law. As rational creatures, we are governed by the same eternal law that governs all creation, but we participate in that law in a distinctive way as being capable of understanding it and enacting it intelligently in our lives over which we have a rational providence that is an image of the divine providence over the whole of creation. So the next section is called Natural Law's Theological Implications. By now it is clear that what Aquinas calls natural law is not called natural because it is made by nature, nor because it is a law of nature considered apart from the supernatural or divine, nor because it is explainable in purely physical terms. Natural law, according to Aquinas, is an expression of divine intelligence as manifested in a particular part of nature, the life of the rational animal, human beings. So natural law is natural in that it is encoded in our nature as being the very kind of being we are, rational animals. And it is also natural in the sense that it is knowable by us through the natural power of reason. Does this mean that a theory of natural law is necessarily theistic? Yes and no. One does not need to believe in God in order to grasp much of the contents of natural law, nor to experience natural law as somehow binding. But yes, to grasp binding or obligatory natural law principles as principles of natural law, that is to conceive of it as a law, does imply an authority, a lawgiver. How and in what way one conceives of the lawgiver as divine may vary. Aquinas obviously has in mind the Trinitarian God of Christian faith. The Stoics identified the divine with the intrinsic pattern of the universe itself. But to conceive of natural law as law is, at least to this extent, a theological commitment. It is useful, however, to distinguish natural law as an expression of divine intelligence from another kind of divine command theory. As typically described, a divine command theory is one which seems to make God's regulation of human behavior extrinsic and therefore seemingly arbitrary as if God made human creatures and then separately contrived a set of rules for our behavior. Natural law, as a part of the eternal law, 
makes the commands of God intrinsic to the creature. The commands are issued in and through the making of the creature to be the kind of creature it is. In other words, according to natural law theory, God's commands for our behavior are encoded in the very constitution of what we are. Just like the rule that water freezes at zero degrees centigrade is encoded in the chemical structure of H2O, and the rule that tomato plants need sunlight is intrinsic to the vegetative life of a tomato plant, the natural law prohibitions against adultery, theft, and murder are not some arbitrary set of rules, but bound up with our very nature as embodied, social, rational beings. For this reason, when John Paul II, in Veritatis Splendor, sought to articulate the Thomistic notion of natural law, he distinguished it from both a notion of self-imposed law, autonomy, he called it, and extrinsically imposed law, heteronomy, other law. Instead, John Paul called it participated theonomy, a sharing in a law from God, affirming and refreshing Aquinas's definition of natural law as man's participation in the eternal law. So while conceiving of natural law as natural law in the way Aquinas did is an inherently theological position, it does not commit one to a particular religion, nor does, it need to al nor does one need to already believe God exists to experience natural law as binding, as something that demands our obedience. And in fact, far from needing to have knowledge of God before one can experience moral obligation, it can be, and often is the case, that the practical experience of moral obligation more effectively than any abstract theoretical proofs, leads people to knowledge of God and his providence over us. The fifth section, contents or scope of natural law, or what natural law doesn't determine. At this point, it is important to summarize briefly how Aquinas talks about natural law in terms of different levels of specification. In the most general, broadest, but least informative way, the natural law can be abstracted to a single first principle, pursue the good. This can be expressed in different ways, do good and avoid evil, act in accord with reason, seek your final end, fulfill your nature, but these are simply different ways of conceiving of a first universal principle of all human action. At this level, nobody can be ignorant of the natural law. We might argue over whether something is good, but not over whether the good is to be done. The next somewhat more informative level of natural law consists in principles still deemed primary, each reflecting one or another dimension of human nature. As substances, we are obligated to conserve ourselves in being. As animals, to safeguard the future of the species and care for our offspring. As rational and social, to seek fellowship with others and with God. It is from this level that one can see the reasonableness of certain basic and usually uncontroversial moral obligations, the prohibitions of murder, adultery, and theft, the requirements to pay debts, to protect and educate children, and to live peaceably with others, and to worship God. <clears throat> it is difficult, but possible, to be ignorant of these commands of natural law. In a healthy culture, mature adults will grasp these truths, but very irrational and immature people, or people who are corrupt or have had no opportunity to form their consciences, can lack some knowledge of these precepts. As we move farther away from these primary principles to secondary and more remote principles of natural law, they depend on higher degrees of awareness, understanding, and experience. It is here that we might place prohibitions against suicide, divorce, polygamy, and contraception, or the various parts of just war theory. These are still parts of the natural law, and no less true, but they are more derivative and more difficult to discern. And as a consequence, many people, including very intelligent and well-educated people, can fail to grasp them. It is common to conceive of natural law in terms of prohibitions. And indeed, this is the aspect of natural law theory that is most emphasized in Veritatis Splendor. But as we have seen, the natural law also commands or requires. And between prohibiting and commanding, we can say that it is in accord with natural law that there are ranges of action that are permitted but not required, what Brian Tierney calls permissive natural law. One way to appreciate this is to see what Aquinas means when he says that man-made law should be a specification of natural law, 
The natural law requires, for instance, that a government protect its citizens, but it does not detail precisely how. So it is up to individual governments to determine, say, traffic laws, or military defense, or environmental protections, or pandemic policies. Speed limits, or battle tactics, or penalties for pollution, or healthcare mandates are not logically deduced from natural law as automatic implications. They are specified by relevant authorities discerning particular circumstances in light of the guidance offered by natural law. The same can be said for determinations an individual person makes for his or her own actions. The natural law tells you to honor your parents, but you have to use your practical reasoning and deliberate how best to do that. The natural law requires that when and if you have kids, you nourish and teach them, but it does not tell you what food to buy or what curriculum in school to use. Nonetheless, you will experience these choices as weighty moral choices in your life, because they are. You will marshal all your resources of practical judgment. You will draw on your conscience. You will seek counsel from others who are wiser and more experienced, all to make sure that you do what is right for your family. It is part of the natural law that you are obligated to exercise your prudential judgment to the best of your ability, even, perhaps especially, when no natural law theory and no articulation of natural law principles can tell you exactly what you must do. Given the indeterminacy of natural law in so much of what matters, we might well ask why or whether we need to speak of natural law at all. We have seen that what is important is to be able to talk about moral obligation and to be able to articulate some principles of moral obligation. But natural law in general is simply our participation in the eternal law. In other words, it is our share in God's providence. The precepts of natural law can, and can be and are called by Aquinas principles of practical reason. That is the precepts grasped by the virtue of prudence. And the notion of conscience also captures the idea that we have a way of being aware of right, of, of right and wrong a way of being aware of God's will for us. And of course, we also have the language of the virtues, especially the cardinal virtues, and especially justice, which is simply the habit of fulfilling one's obligations, of doing one's proper work. So given that we have so much other language to describe what Aquinas means by natural law, what is gained by talking about it as natural law? I've already mentioned that Aquinas did not find it necessary to discuss natural law in his commentary on Aristotle's ethics, nor in his sentences commentary or the Summa Contra Gentiles. The placement of the discussion of law in the Summa Theologiae tells us that St. Thomas was concerned to accommodate the tradition of natural law discourse, but to orient it with respect to other discourse as part of a larger moral teaching. Obviously, the notion of natural law helps Aquinas connect ethical teaching to specifically Christian understanding of the old law and the new law. The Ten Commandments he treats as a summary of some basic precepts of natural law, which the Jews could have and should have known, and on some level they did know, but forgot or neglected them due to social corruption and personal sin. So in terms of mode of promulgation, Part of directly revealed law, what Aquinas calls divine law, is offered as an aid to those for whom the natural promulgation was available but insufficiently effective. The new law, the covenant of redemption in Christ, is a further extension of divine law, specifically revealed by God, but unlike the Ten Commandments, going beyond what could possibly have been known by reason. The notion of natural law also helps Aquinas to connect this Christian teaching to what he learns from Aristotle's ethics. As I mentioned, Aristotle does not say much about natural law, but he does say much about virtues, which orient agents to their proper end. And especially he talks about the virtue of practical wisdom, prudence, by which agents are also aware of and deliberate well about achieving their natural end. Aquinas locates the discussion of natural law then within a general discussion of law, including eternal law as God's providence over the universe and divine law as God's special assistance in our salvation. This treatise on law is located between a long treatment of virtue and vice and sin as the intrinsic principles of and obstacles to human perfection and a discussion of grace as God's in extrinsic help empowering us to overcome sin and vice to fulfill our proper nature as rational beings. The so-called treatise on law then, although not obviously necessary for Aquinas to articulate his theological pedagogy, 
is almost a microcosm of the whole Summa Theologiae as recapitulating the story of human life, emanating from divine reason, participating in divine reason, and returning for fulfillment to divine reason. And so my conclusion. I want to end with a reflection about the relationship between philosophy, law, and art. One of the most famous collections of Renaissance frescoes is Raphael's Stanza della Signatura in the Vatican. I'm sure some of you know the School of Athens with Plato and Aristotle engaged in friendly philosophical argument at the center. You've all seen that, right? Less known, on the opposite wall is the disputation of the sacrament. Theologians and saints gathered around the Eucharist, a unity of divine and human that I think Raphael wanted to suggest. Plato and Aristotle were seeking without even knowing it. But the rest of the room as well is ordered to that culminating Eucharistic miracle. On the north wall is depicted poetry, persuasive and beautiful speech that can lead people, often more successfully than philosophical argument, to pursue the ultimate source of beauty and goodness. And on the south wall, there is a depiction of law. It is common to describe three female figures high on this wall as representing three cardinal virtues, courage, temperance, and prudence, with justice on the ceiling as the fourth. But another interpretation, which I find more convincing, has these women as the three graces, or perhaps three legal sisters, described in Hesiod. Counting in favor of this is that it takes account of the likely influences of Seneca, and especially Cicero, in providing medieval theologians a way to characterize the role of divine justice as informing and uniting civil and ecclesiastical law. This interpretation also more appropriately links the depiction of law and justice back to the Athenian philosophers and helps us to see their harmony. Plato and Aristotle are almost always described as disagreeing. But Plato, pointing up, holds the Timaeus, which is about divine governance of the whole of creation. And Aristotle, gesturing in front of him, is holding the Nicomachean Ethics, which considers the role of ordering all human life to God, and especially the virtue of prudence as allowing us to discern and apply natural justice. The philosophers Plato and Aristotle are central, but around them Raphael wanted to depict all of human learning, all human art, as ordering human life to Christ. Philosophy seeks truth, but we weak and embodied human beings are more than intellects. We have passions and desires and find ourselves in social networks and political bonds. We need the inspiration of lovely poetry to persuade us and the judgment of sound law to guide us. Both have their ultimate source in God, who in his wisdom appeals to our own rational nature in modes that accord with the inherent and inherited limits of our embodied social human condition. I hope I have fulfilled my promise to introduce you to the natural law tradition. I've tried to help you see what Aquinas meant by describing natural law as man's participation in the eternal law, as our distinctively human sharing in divine providence an effective manifestation of our membership in a community with God as the exemplar of just rule whose wisdom should inform every human community as it informs all creation. Aquinas's conception of natural law then helps us take seriously our responsibility as moral agents with the burden to act individually and in relation to others by describing our actions and our communities as part of an intelligible order that comes from and invites us to return to its source in a perfect divine reason. Thank you.